All right. This story is about the Saracens and the Black Knights. Not a lot of talking about Black Europe, so this video is going to take a little dive into Black Europe. Um, I'm reading from, that, like I said, it's the Black Knights by Manahan Keefe. Olaf France, a generic word of the word like Roland in Europe, they describe and literally historically literate with Africans and being African. Yet it seems to some intellectual trepidation and acknowledging their presence. There seems far greater comfort in the notion that sometimes Saracens are Danes, and as well than the idea that some medieval Europeans may have been African. And certainly, some Danes may have been Saracens, when the term Saracens is equated to the ambiguous Pion. Current discussion surrounding the question of race and our understanding in medieval Europe is welcome. Yet, it may be a point missed. According to these texts, Europe is culturally, religiously, and somatically diverse, and all at this level of highly conceptualization. In lies the burning of racialized thinking, the attempt to unpack and disengage our current racial attitudes from medieval Europe they have constructed become critical. Our rationalization of our construction of medieval whenever it occurs, is precisely the race need to be enjoying. Not necessarily to postulate on the racism of medieval and renaissance period, but to recognize and come to grips with the fact that the ways in which we as modern and postmodern people construct and theorize race, ways which appear to have been fundamentally different from the period we study, sh severely shape and constrain our readings of these periods and these history, which are produced about them. Here we might invert Tom's hair inquiry concerning the difference between Middle Ages that make an important concern and the difference we call Middle Ages. Indeed, in the difference we call Middle Ages consists of ultimate the trouble difference. I would argue not necessary for the people of the period, it's a trouble of our own making of a world that has its ambiguities. About race and the ways that we are construed. And many contributions of the special volumes of the Journal of Medieval and Early Modern Studies on race have concluded there is a modern construction of race, but there also lack clarity to this unity, utility, particularly when it is postulated as racism. There is a historical graph nexus between race and modernity, and the historians it has constructed. Clearly, the medieval period has not escaped this. This essay is an etymological and a historical critique. Let me begin here. African and medieval Europe is the elephant in the parlor, referenced extensively in primary sources, folklore, literature, and iconography. The present is still debated at best and overlooked at worst. In a second analysis, this present is the sun to the side of an anomaly or simply given as a knee-jerk reaction of negative thinking. We are supposed to accept that everything African, therefore black in the Middle Ages, carried a connotation of bad, the evil, it is here that Lampere investigated observation of the construction of the monstrous race and the cultural othering as the product of the late Middle Ages become apparent to an importance of this project. To imply how the African might have been construed or understood, known, or performed prior to this movement is suggested in the words of Jeffrey Cohen. And the continuation of a racialized performance of our own and a racialized performance that can challenge and create a dangerous knowledge which can topple the whole insurmountable system. Lampier tells us that her work is challenging in the rules of both pre-modern and post-modern racial imagination. Why not then? A challenge in the modern conceptualization of race as well. Such a challenge is inherent in what James termed as counter-hermetic power or in a line of interrogation. This is exactly what William E. Bernard Du Bois had in mind nearly a half a century ago when he wrote, I am challenging authority. Courage E. Woodson reiterated the theme when he commented on the presence of Black Knights of Ethereum. J.A. Rogers' richly racialized work in particular, Sex and Race, also underlined the pearls of challenging the modern homology. In the analysis of writing, historically between the subjects of relation to power, in the light of Lampier thesis of traveling during the Middle Ages as a genre making historical and social political, economic, and cultural transitions, it might be argued that the power and rights of the period were challenging the power of blackness, the power of the more the Saracen, the African, the Black. Cohen underscores this treatment in the work of the Sultan of Babylon, where the Saracens are blue, some are yellow, some are black as Moors. Here he equates the danger of Saracen and Moor with beauty and pleasure and this construction type and bringing forth the Arab Europeans who are the witnesses. Then in the footnote, he tells us empathetically that Saracens are Moors.
What is urban a period in relifying the modern era is the political economy of the ethnicizing and racializing discourse. This is a process of description and creation of political economic purposes. We might add to these definitions the following observations. <clears throat> Which certainly complicate and further racialize the aspect of Saracen Moore and more applicable concept of the Oriental. He and Dunbarber were also helpful in stipulating Moors and Saracen as synonymous cultural concepts and their members are indeed black. In the nature of Lapis analysis of John of Pliano, Caprini's History of the Mongols, what takes here is a recognition of the shift that the gene marks, the genre marks, which is make of it to phrase him in Han. In Lapis' word, the challenge got an epical position, which carries the responsibility of recognizing the significant part we play in constructing identities passed through the same over and others in the realms of significance. And enduring questions to me is the economic agency of the characteristics and attracted my attention in these texts is this. The Saracens, the Moors, the Africans. Indeed, if Africa becomes a backdrop of which Oriental things are known, then Africa becomes an infiltrant instrument of that knowing and an anthropological lever of its being. Coyne explains that African in the intertemplate South provided the palest glimpse of racialization present representation of Islam, especially in the Muslim East. The Arthurian cycle in which the Saracens can be characterized as African, they center on the character of Sir Palamides and his comrades. The prose Tristan dates from approximately 1230 to 1235 AD. Rene Christians inform us that the character of Palamides is another creation on the part of prose of the author. He is a knight that is seemingly prowess, generous, and intelligent, and moreover, a Saracen, a fact which no doubt keep wisely keeps it to himself. In her treatment of Parmenas, Rene Christus Curtis is justified in circumstances in the cases in the cautious and the possibility of how a knight might be presented ceremonially. Her assertion that Parmenas is the creation of part of the author is also curious. It may be there is some simply enough amount of information for such a description, and that such a description hold no interest of her in her audience, or that she may be working on an epilogical or separate elegies that prelayed the notion, notion of the Saracen as an African. While there is, however, no reluctance on her part, on the part of the author of the text, exists to identify Paramedians as a Saracen. There are certain modern implications that, as a Saracen, the medieval European space, let alone the court of Ireland, Paramedians must not be quite black to the perceive of the Bahama Hama. It is the Curtis, however, who identified Paramedians as the Black Knight. This is after a tournament which he emerged as a champion and is forward our first description of him. An unknown knight wearing a black shield and two swords and a sign of his readiness to fight against two opponents. He is Sir Pamias, the Saracen, the father of Escobar, who was a knight of great volume. Curtis' circumcision of the, of the various texts of the old French and old English might lead to the conclusion that the only thing noteworthy of Pamias' difference is the Syrian dress. Yet there are two important differences known in the prose of the Tristan in the character of Parmenides. One proceeds to detect and to mark a Saracen as an important symbolic presence. The other, two centuries later, cast the Saracens as African. The issue goes back to what I term Curtis' assertion that the Parmenides is a creation, a manufacture of the terms Tristan. And that seems to suggest that Parmenides' presence can only be fiction and imaginative where the other characters are greatly substance. Certainly on the level of the craft of fiction, characters are created, yet the assertion may be read further as a marginalization of the Saracen and reinforces the coronal notion that the Saracen more, the African, is abject and intolerable, or at the very least, beyond pale. It suggests that Hermes have been given all his virtues in spite of his Saracen-ness in an attempt of the virtuous knight. It is the only possession of some affirmative abilities. However, Scott and Lennon and Linda Mockmore provide other possibilities. They indicate that the 13th century Parmenides predates the cyclic version of the proposed Tristan, and the implication of the character construction of Parmenides influenced Tristan rather than being an afterthought. The term Saracen Moore it seems far more marginal, in many cases more affirmative and affirming than a jack or tolerable. In beginning with the prose of the Tristan, the Saracen Moore as characterization might deem essential to certain parts of the text as an ethical marker through the mid medieval period. The Africanness of the Saracen is certainly uh, of Sir Parmenas is in questionable proportion in the polls that a Tristan only on, on, is our only source. 
The attrition has only established that Parmenius is a Saren. He dresses in black. His armaments are black and that he is violent. It takes Thomas Maury shifting through three centuries of Arthurian versions to cer certify that Sidian's pedigree. Marley does that to introduce us to Saracen, Sir Primus, who I dubbed the, the first black knight around table. During Arthur's imperial adventures on the continent, Gwen and Wayne encounters a Saracen of Tuxedy. In the battle, he proves them equal. Garnet convinces Saracen to convert. In the conversion that ensues, Marley provides us with a glimpse of the definition of Saracen, a one that holds the courses in a morte de rebel. The Saracen introduced himself as Primus. His lineage is quite noble as he is descendant of Alexander and Hector, and a right inheritor of Alexander in Africa. He declares himself to be an African, and it's safe to assume that all the more contemporary audience thought all Saracens gobbling through the pages to be similar. In this exchange, along with the description of the European battlefield, Warnley set the stage in the context of for how Saracens might be known, indeed as Africans, and numbers so profuse there no doubt will make their presence. Primus was not alone. He formed an alliance between the noblest men of Dauphiny and the lords of Lombardy and the garrison of Godard and the Saracens of the Southland. That number is 60,000 of good armed men. Primus' service to Arthur was cause of value. So valuable, in fact, that the king anointed him to be Christian and do his first name Primus be made a duke and a knight of the round table. And here the accolades for the African knights begin in Arthur's court with the first black knight of the round table, who wandering dubbed no nobler man nor a better knight of his hands. Arthur thought so also, and he bequeathed Primus the Dutch near the defeated Duke of Lorraine. In three centuries of more than separate audience to pose of Tristan and Marley's Monte Dunhar, it seems clear that the text cannot necessarily be read with the same intentions or seen with responding with the same devices, or at least the same conclusion, I have the little possibility that they are not being forced. Here is such a side to Wolfman von Bach's 13th century profile. Prize begins with the implication of the issue of race like the Mormon's compound. The Maureen in the 14th century Dutch piece of Artanian, was translated in the forms of an unprecedented Mori d'Orhar. Illustrations are made both of Praza and Maureen. To reinforce this argument in the preface of Maureen, Jesse Winston and his translator offer another intriguing piece of the story. She suggests that Anna Volo, another brother of Praza, has been substituted for Percival as Maureen's father in the translation of the text. In light of Praval's storyline, this is an interesting complication. Like seven champions of beauty, neither can resist the beauty and the charm and intellect and the heroism of the dark women they choose to associate with, or whom actively they choose to associate with them. The result of these unions are questionably beautiful and powerful children who come to epitomize the very tenets of chivalry. As Western put it, the radical racialized modification and the substitution of Africa for Percival is done in a later version to allow Percival to maintain his purity, his virginity as a grail knight. Even we accept Anavar as a Moraine father, the motif remain. He too was shown to be a father of a son in the choice of women of his prosperity for leaving in him. The abandonment is the central premise of the Moraine. The Moraine quest to find his father, so he joins to his fatherland, and there, the readers first encounter him, he encounters a company of lights led by Lancelot. As the text of the Moraine leaves no question as to the Moraine physical characterization, we might assume that the significant element of the Moorish population itself is depicted. Here, the name of a Moraine is derived from the term Moor, and forces such characterization and depiction of the text includes the actors on his way. On the ninth day, there came riding towards us a knight on godly steed, well armed with all. He was all black, even as I tell you his head, his body, his hands were black, save only his teeth. His shield and his armor was those of a moor, and black as a raven. Then there was black bithern, and he drew near Lancelot, and bared his head, which is pitch black, and in the fashion of his land, moors are black and burnt berries. And in but in all that man will praise the night he was fair and after his kind. Though he were black, what could he be worse? In him, he was naughty slight. He was taller than a foot and a half than any other knight who stood beside him. And yet he was scarce and more than a child. This description offered by Lancelot and the company leaves no doubt that Moraine is a black knight from head to toe, in and out. It also indicates that Moraine was the virtues required of knighthood. In her observation of racial modification, which occurs 
concerning the morning pedigree, Weston notes that the implication as well in doing, she gives something more to ponder when she states that the genuine tradition of the Moor is a near kinsman of Percival really existed. I, and I see no reason to doubt that he did. He must have belonged to Percival's story prior to any development of the Grail tradition. What well, Weston implies that genealogy and the literary tradition is born out of ever over again of the literary that period. These texts in a large volume of tendency of literature and forced the question of scholars like Manila lay before. And the question that lays before us, essentially it is, what is the history and the myth? In that case, we might say to all of us, the Saracen as Moors, as African as Black. Arthur historically has otherwise emerged from the declining structure of the late Roman Empire. So during the Roman Empire time, there were Black people there. Yet these various Africans came to Britain with repeated cultural retentions and were not totally Roman. Many, as Western put it, less Romanized and keeping their native styles, weapon, and tongue. It's difficult to match panties and other sides and morals at the round table, sporting their locks and their twists or dreads that was characterizing the African hairstyle depicted on the Trajan column. While the army of Britain began to deteriorate in the mid 5th century, and Roman army did not coincide with the termination of royal rule in AD 409. Presence of the decline of empire, Afro Roman Britons must have emerged in significant numbers. Numbers significant enough that they will be members of a community who impair cultural legacies which become embedded in a British lore. Their interactions, intermarriage, and building of communities is witness their corporations to the British life in their very deaths. The British Roman experienced numerous illustrations and opportunities of crafting identities, which in the emergence of Polynesians and his brother are both real and imagined form. This reality in which there was Africans of rank, bearing who sees imaginations and inspire all fairly countrymen in the land of their adoption. That tradition would properly present us with an African, more Saracen blackness within the geopolitical landscapes of the whitest of all people of the modern age, England, and Europe as a whole. The fundamental question about the natures of the Saracens and the Black Knights the appearance of these questions will change the face of Europe and the medieval Renaissance past so closely aligned to it. It may topple as logical systems. So, um, this one was, you know, about Europe and about how our ancestors were over there still running kingdoms and stuff like that, still doing their thing. We're going to do some black African European kingdoms because, you know, it's stuff that should be talked about. I know this reading was kind of, it was kind of difficult for me, but, um, yeah, we're going to do some readings about that. Um, a kind of Henry... Keith, the guy who wrote this, he's a professor at Villanova University. So anyway, subscribe to the channel. Much love. We're going to keep on popping off this African history worldwide. Pan-Africanism. Peace.